Καλησπέρα κυρίε και κύριοι. Καλώ ορίσατε και πάλι είμαι εδώ στο οίκημα τη ελληνική κυπριακή αδελφότητα για μία ακόμα διάλεξη στα πλαίσια τη συνεργασία τη αδελφότητα με το Ελεύθερο Πανεπιστήμιο και το Κυπριακό Πανεπιστήμιο και οι διαλέξεις αυτές ε, ονομάζονται το Ελεύθερο Πανεπιστήμιο για την Ομογένεια του Λονδίνου. Έχει καιρό να το κάνουμε. Δέκατος χρόνος διαλέξη. Δέκα χρόνια. Γι' αυτό είμαστε ευγνώμονες και σε όλους εσάς που κάθε φορά και με τέτοιον καιρό ε, κάνετε το προσπάθεια να είστε εδώ μαζί μας. Απόψε η διάλεξη θα έχει θέμα The prospect of partition in the United Kingdom should Cyprus say όχι and thereby help to guarantee the ένωσης between England and Scotland. Η συζητής θα είναι ο φίλος μας πλέον, από καιρό φίλος μας, ο δόκτωρ Κλέαρχος Κυριακίδης, τον καλωσορίζουμε και πάλι. Είναι ε, δικηγόρος, non-practicing και ο καλύτερος lecturer στο Πανεπιστήμιο του ε, Hertfordshire, the Havilland Campus, στο Hatfield. Χορηγή επικοινωνίας της ε, εκδήλωσης αυτής είναι όπως πάντα ο ελληνικός ραδιοφωνικός σταθμός Λονδίνου, το LGR, το Hellenic TV, οι εφημερίδες Ελευθερία και Παρικιακή, το Ραδιοφωνικό Ίδρυμα Κύπρου, το ΚΙΠΕ, η εφημερίδα Φιλελεύθερος. Θα ήθελα να καλέσω τον πρόεδρο της Παγκόσμιας Νεολαία, τον φίλο μας τον Χρήστο, να μας πει λίγα λόγια για την διάλεξη. Thank you, Nino. I'm going to switch to English, um, if I may. Uh, the lecture will be divided, or more appropriately, partitioned uh, into three sections. The first part will draw attention to the fundamental differences and similarities between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Cyprus, and more specifically between Scotland and the Turkish-occupied part of the Republic. The second part will suggest that the Republic of Cyprus, its citizens and diaspora, must take an active interest in the Scottish referendum process. And the third part will focus on the matters of substance. More specifically, it will consider whether the Republic of Cyprus, its citizens and diaspora, should openly object to the proposed partition of the United Kingdom, and if so, whether they should object to an independent Scotland remaining or becoming a member of the European Union. I now hand over to Andreas Vaisilis to give a biographical note of Cleathos. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Cleathos Kyriagiris, holds an LLB in Honours in Law and Politics degree from the University of Birmingham, together with a Master's in Philosophy in International Relations and a PhD in History degrees from the University of Cambridge and a postgraduate diploma in legal practice from the University of Westminster. He is a senior lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Hertfordshire, where he teaches constitutional law and professional ethics. In addition, he is a non-practicing solicitor as well as an active member of the Law Society of England and Wales. He is an executive committee member of both the West London Law Society and the Hertfordshire Law Society. He is a former research fellow of the S.Y. Royal Air Force Staff College and a former tutor at the Strategic Studies courses of Her Majesty's Forces, which used to be organized at Maddingley Hall in Cambridge. His research interests draw upon his cross-disciplinary educational background. His publications primarily relate to the United Kingdom's ties with Cyprus, to the legal aspects of the Cyprus question 
and quite separately to the Attorney General and the law officers of the Crown in the United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Dr. Pirajidis. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for that uh, very warm introduction. Uh, I had to do two things at the very outset. One is to, to thank the organisers for all of their hard work uh, in terms of organising this evening's event. Uh, I know how much uh, work has gone into this and I'm grateful to them. The second thing I must do is say that um, everything that I will argue tonight represents my own personal views and they should not be associated with any of the organisations with which I'm affiliated. I have to say that because I will probably end up upsetting a large number of people across the world by the uh, time that I finish. So if I upset anybody, it's uh, tough, but I, I will hold the responsibility for that. Winston Churchill spent a sizable proportion of his lengthy parliamentary career as the Member of Parliament for Dundee in Scotland. He was therefore familiar with uh, Scotland and particularly fond of fine Scotch whisky, some of which might be drunk uh, when the souvlaia is served. However, Churchill was also a keen student of history, and he is said to have remarked that of all the small nations on this earth, perhaps only the ancient Greeks can surpass the Scots in their contribution to mankind. Churchill was surely right. Think of David Hume, who is often identified with Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, as among the leading lights in the history of philosophy. Think of Adam Smith, the father of modern economics. Think of Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone, and Sir Alexander Fleming, who first produced penicillin. And with those preliminary thoughts in mind, and the joint interests of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Cyprus in mind, I have prepared this lecture in response to, this is like being a politician, being photographed. <laughs> Thank you, oh, it's okay. Um, I prepared this lecture in response to the prospect of Scottish independence and thus the partition of what is now known as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And just to recap, I'm going to begin by outlining the similarities as well as differences between the United Kingdom and Cyprus. I'm secondly going to move on to suggest that the Republic of Cyprus and its diaspora must take an active interest in the Scottish question. And thirdly, I will consider whether or not the Republic should object in public to the uh, prospect of Scottish independence and do what Tony Blair did before the Annan plan, meddle in the domestic politics of another country. Now let's begin with the similarities and the differences. I, I'm not a member of parliament but I'm an academic and I ought to declare an interest. I'm a citizen of this country with roots in the eastern Mediterranean including in Bedra and Lisi, two villages in the Turkish occupied part of northern Cyprus. So inevitably, I'm intrinsically hostile to the concept of partition. Scotland was once an internationally recognised independent state, in contrast to the Turkish-occupied part of uh, the Republic. But under the Union with England Act of 1707, Scotland chose by legal means to be united with England. And England similarly chose to be united with Scotland. Today, Scotland continues to be an integral part of the United Kingdom, albeit subject to the provisions of the Scotland Act, which have introduced devolution. That's not fully-fledged federation, but it's one step or two steps short of federation. That's why Scotland has its own government, its own parliament, and also its own judiciary, although it had its own judiciary even before devolution. By the same token, Wales now has its own uh, assembly, as it's called, and its own government. Uh, be all that as it may, the United Kingdom may be staring into the abyss of partition. Devolution, which was introduced in, uh, after 1998, was designed to forestall the moves towards Scottish nationalism and Scottish independence. It's fueled 
Scottish nationalism and the campaign for Scottish independence. And there's a lesson there to be drawn from Cyprus. As we all know, the aim in Cyprus is to establish a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation consisting of two politically equal communities. If that is an objective that is designed to forestall any future campaign towards fully-fledged partition, the British lesson suggests otherwise. But that's another story for another day. Little history, little modern history is needed, and perhaps at this point, if this technology works, I can um, draw your attention to some recent history. In the Scottish parliamentary elections held in May 2011 under the devolution arrangements, the pro-independent Scottish National Party, the SNP, gained a majority of seats in the devolved Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh, that magnificent city known as the Athens of the North. Thus, for the first time since devolution was introduced, the SNP took control of the devolved Scottish Government, which is also based in Edinburgh. And Alex Salmond, perhaps the most canny and wily politician in this country, if not Europe, has become the First Minister of Scotland. Not the Prime Minister, but he's known as the First Minister. Alex Salmond and his party, and the ministers within the Scottish Government, thereafter set in motion a campaign with a view to arranging a referendum in Scotland. As Mr Salmond has put it, independence is not a single event, but a process. That's very important because I'm going to dis divide my analysis into process and substance. And there are lessons to be drawn for Cyprus as well. The campaign for independence is a process. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you go to Sainsbury's or Tesco or any of the other big supermarkets, when they sell pr produce from Scotland, they don't put the flag of the United Kingdom anymore. They put the flag of Scotland. Whereas when they sell English milk, they'll put the flag of the United Kingdom. The campaign towards independence has already begun. It's incremental, it's taking place before our eyes. There hasn't been a, a one-off grant of independence, but the Scots, very carefully, have been incrementally moving towards independence. And there's a lesson there for Cyprus. Because in 1983, as I'll explain, the, uh, the, 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 the regime in the occupied area declared independence unilaterally, and that failed because it was unlawful. And since then, they've been engaging in a process designed towards gradually moving towards recognition. I'm going to suggest they won't succeed, ultimately, but they have lear learnt this lesson, the Scots. Independence can be a one-off event, but it can also be achieved gradually by stealth, and by, by careful moves along the way. Now, the latest pivotal development in the Scottish referendum process has been the conclusion of the Edinburgh Agreement on the 15th of October uh, 2012, signed by Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, David Cameron MP, and the First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond. The Edinburgh Agreement declares as follows, the, and I'm reading here from the actual agreement, the governments of the United Kingdom and Scotland are agreed that the referendum should have a clear legal base, be legislated for by the Scottish Parliament, be conducted so as to command the confidence of parliaments, governments and people, and deliver a fair test and a decisive expression of the views of the people of Scotland and a result that everyone will respect. The governments have agreed to promote an ordering council under the Scotland Act in the United Kingdom and Scottish Parliament to allow a single question referendum on Scottish independence to be held before the end of 2014. The order will put it beyond doubt that the Scottish Parliament can legislate for that referendum. Now what does all that mean and why is it significant and what bearing does it have upon uh, the Republic of Cyprus? First, it must be admitted, whatever one's views may be, that the constitutional future of Scotland and the process underpinning it is being, by and large, plotted in the public domain. In the Parliament of Scotland, in the Parliament of the United Kingdom, by means of uh, press conferences, public statements, consultation papers which are published and to which the 
population may contribute through public lectures, the transcripts of which are, are published by the ministers concerned, and other means. The future of Scotland is not being determined behind closed doors by means of secret negotiations with no minutes published, no prior consultation exercise and no proper uh, means for the public to engage actively in the process. That's what's bedeviled Cyprus over the years. The process itself has been inherently undemocratic, top-down and part of Middle Eastern politics where, where people meet behind closed doors and agree things for the, for the people to, um, I was going to say, suffer from. Suffer from. In a European democracy, and Cyprus must now be regarded as a European democracy, constitutional matters of this magnitude are by and large conducted in public, with the politicians accountable to the electorate, through the ballot box and through Parliament, and through the publication of the relevant documentation, so that we can see what's, been, what's going on and what's being agreed. And the publication of documentation in draft form at its formative stages so that we can have an input into the system and lobby the system. Unless I'm mistaken, none of that has happened in Cyprus, apart from the old press conference here or leak there. So there is a, um, there is a lesson to be drawn, and the point has been quite rightly made by Prime Minister Cameron and Deputy Prime Minister Clegg in the preface to the United Kingdom's consultation paper, which was published in January 2012. Uh, Messrs Cameron and Clegg state, the future of Scotland must not be worked out in secret behind closed doors. So that's the first reason why the Edinburgh Agreement is important. Secondly, the Edinburgh Agreement presages the conveyance of the power to legislate for a referendum from the Parliament of the United Kingdom to the Parliament of Scotland in Edinburgh. Indeed, a few days after the conclusion of the Edinburgh Agreement, Mr. Salmond, the First Minister of Scotland, reiterated that the, um, the referendum question would be, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? So the United Kingdom government has effectively surrendered the power to legislate for a referendum to the Scottish Parliament. I don't know what they, what's going on in these negotiations in Cyprus, which have been going on for years, but we need to know what has been agreed behind closed doors, if anything, as to the process under which the constitutional future of the Republic of Cyprus will be determined if, and I hope it doesn't, if it is transformed into a so-called bizonal by common federation. These are crucial matters that ought to be in the public domain, not kept behind closed doors. The process is crucial. Thirdly, the Edinburgh Agreement has killed off any lingering hope that the citizens of England, Wales and Northern Ireland would have their own separate referendum or referenda. Or indeed, whether or not Scotland should be allowed to exit the United Kingdom. So we're not going to vote in this referendum. We've been shut out of the picture. That's a mistake, in my view. There, are, there may be legal arguments that Mr. Salmon could deploy to support his uh, argument that Scotland should be given the exclusive right to, to have a referendum. But why are we being excluded? And in the future in Cyprus, is a similar pattern going to be played out? Is, if there's a bizonal, bicommunal federation, is the regime in the north going to follow the Scottish path and insist upon having a unilateral referendum? You know, Zbigniew Brzezinski was um, the national security advisor to Jimmy Carter uh, when Carter was president in the 1970s, and he was an academic, and one of his books uh, referred to international relations as a chess game. And this is what's going on here. There's a chess game that's being played. And the Republic of Cyprus ought to be thinking several moves ahead. Hopefully they are. But without a transparent peace process, without transparency in those negotiations, we're at a loss to know whether or not these sorts of procedural matters are being discussed behind closed doors. And if they are dis being discussed behind closed doors, what is being uh, stitched into the detail? Fourthly, the 
Edinburgh Agreement expressly confirms that the referendum must be legal. Meanwhile, it's implicit in the Edinburgh Agreement, even though it doesn't spell it out, that in the event of a yes vote in a referendum, any subsequent breakup of the United Kingdom must likewise be legal. Now, in the event of a breakup of the, uh, the United Kingdom, let me just go back to the map of. Sorry, I'm going forwards there. Let's go back to the map of the United Kingdom. In the event of a yes vote, so I'm playing a bit of chess here and I'm thinking several moves ahead. In the event of a yes vote in favour of Scottish independence, the likeliest option would be for Scotland to eventually withdraw from the United Kingdom by means of a mutually agreed act of secession. So it's, a, it's a carving out or a, or, a, or a splitting away. So the United Kingdom would remain in place, but Scotland would then emerge as a new state, a new sovereign state. Another less likely option may be for the United Kingdom to be dissolved altogether and for two new states to emerge from the ashes. Now you can see the parallels here with Cyprus. They're talking about the creation of two constituent states under a loose federal umbrella. Well, what's going to happen? Is there going to be a dissolution of the Republic of Cyprus and then the birth of two new states? under a loop federal umbrella, and is that federal umbrella going to be a new state? Or is the new state of affairs, to use the Annan plan terminology, going to act as a successor to the previous state? These are fairly fundamental procedural questions that ought to be in the public domain. I don't know, perhaps you can tell me, I may be wrong. Has there been a consultation exercise with all of these documents placed in the public domain? Has the Attorney General of Cyprus given uh, public lectures in which he set out the legal position, as the, as the Scottish Advocate General has, has quite rightly done? Now, whichever path is adopted, whether or not it's a, a, a dissolution of the United Kingdom and the creation of two new states, or the secession of Scotland, which seems more likely, a consensus seems to exist that the relevant aspects of law must be obeyed. They must be honoured by all concerned. Now, let me just move on to uh, my next point. Let's look at how Cyprus was subject to a partition, albeit de facto, and how the, uh, the Turkish Cypriot regime, acting at the behest of Ankara, uh, attempted to procure secession. Now, I don't, we all know the history of Cyprus. I don't need to go into it in any detail. But let me just pinpoint a number of key legal steps which were taken by Turkey. Turkey invaded and occupied the Republic of Cyprus in an unlawful and unethical act of military aggression. Turkey unlawfully and unethically procured the expulsion of the lawful residents of northern Cyprus from their homes on the basis of their race or religion. And they engaged in the unlawful as well as unethical occupation of northern Cyprus. That was in 1974. In 1983, as many of you will remember, the regime in the occupied area issued a unilateral declaration of independence. They purported to issue a unilateral declaration of independence. And thereby purported to procure the secession of northern Cyprus from the Republic of Cyprus. Now, the Turkish Cypriot UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence, provoked a hostile international reaction which the Scottish Nationalist Party is no doubt keen to avoid. That's perhaps one reason why we haven't seen a UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence, in Scotland. And that's perhaps why Alex Salmond is following the procedural path that he is adopting. Now, going back to Cyprus, let's find the, the statement that was issued. This is, by the way, a map of Cyprus taken from the Minister of Defence website, it's in the public domain, and you will note that the armed forces of this country and the Minister of Defence 
display Cyprus without a, even a green line. They regard the Republic of Cyprus as being one territory, one sovereign state. Of course, there is an international boundary in Ebuskobi and Igeja, which, is, which are the two areas that the United Kingdom retained sovereignty over and continue to assert sovereignty over today. But as far as the armed forces of this country are concerned, there's, no, there's not even a green line. Whereas when you see, um, for example, a Sky News recently had a map of Cyprus and they didn't even have the courtesy to put a dotted line. They put a, a straight line, which signified an international frontier. There's no international frontier across the centre of Cyprus. It's a ceasefire line, nothing more and nothing less. Why has the United Kingdom adopted that position? Well, I'll, it's a story for another day, but the key point to draw your attention to is the statement delivered by Sir Geoffrey Howe QCMP, as Lord Howe was then known, uh, in the House of Commons on the day of the UDI, the 15th of November 1983. This is what Sir Geoffrey said. Now remember, Sir Geoffrey was a, and he still is, a distinguished Queen's Counsel, that's a senior barrister, who delivered this statement, presumably having taken expert legal advice from within the Foreign Office and possibly the Attorney General as well. 1983, Sir Geoffrey stated, Her Majesty's Government deplore this action by the Turkish Cypriot community, which amounts to a declaration of secession. We have issued a statement which makes it clear that the declaration is incompatible with the 1960 treaties. Our position has always been that we recognise only one Republic of Cyprus. That remains the position today. And in substance, nothing has changed since 1983, except for what we are occasionally seeing, the incremental de facto recognition of the occupied area and its regimes by certain public bodies in this country and by certain pub private bodies in this country. But in substance, in substance, as this map suggests, there is only one Republic of Cyprus. The Act of Secession of 1983 failed. And the United Nations Security Council has reinforced that with the resolution which you are no doubt all uh, familiar with. The UDI, according to the United Nations Security Council, is incompatible with the 1960 treaties. The Security Council deplores the declaration of the Turkish Cypriot authorities, considers the declaration to be legally invalid, calls for its withdrawal, and calls for all states to respect the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of the Republic of Cyprus. They also refer to non-alignment, which is now a dead letter. So, why am I drawing your attention to this? Uh, I'm drawing your attention to this to make a very important distinction between what is happening in Scotland, which is, a legally, which is legally a part of the United Kingdom, which is attempting, with the cooperation of the United Kingdom, to procure a legal referendum, and thereafter, if there's a yes vote, a legal secession. Scotland does not want to fall into the trap that Turkey fell into by going down the illegal route. And interestingly enough, it wasn't reported very well uh, at the time. The International Court of Justice had to deal with the secession of Kosovo, and it issued a, a, an advisory opinion on the legality of the unilateral declaration of independence issued in respect to Kosovo. And the International Court of Justice, this is the, the World uh, Court, um, referred to the unilateral declaration of independence in Cyprus, which was declared illegal, the UDI in southern Rhodesia from 1965, which was declared illegal, and the uh, unilateral declaration in Republika Srpska, part of Bosnia, which was similarly uh, de deemed to be illegal. And having expressly cited the resolutions in respect to those countries, the uh, International Court of Justice made the point that the UDIs in Cyprus, the UDI in Cyprus, as well as in other cases, was declared illegal because of the circumstances and background against which the UDI was made. And it refers to the unlawful use of force or other egregious violations of norms of general international law. So illegality is at the crux of understanding why 
The United Kingdom took this view in 1983, why the Security Council took this view in 1983, and why the International Court of Justice made that statement in its 2010 decision over Kosovo. There's one other major difference between Cyprus and Scotland, and I'm conscious of the time. The other major difference is that, by and large, the population of Scotland consists of lawful residents, British citizens and others who are there lawfully. What has happened in the, the Turkish occupied area is that Turkey has engaged in Lebensraum. Lebensraum was a Nazi German policy of invading and occupying territory, expelling the population because they happened to belong to the wrong religion or the wrong race, and then colonizing the occupied area with Germans who would, in the fullness of time, become the permanent settled population of the, the territory in question. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the international community wanted to put a stop to Nazi German practices, and therefore, and politicians in Cyprus and elsewhere hate me when I draw this to their attention, because it's an inconvenient provision of law. The international community introduced Article 59 of the Fourth Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war. This was concluded in Geneva on the 12th of August 1949. And it provides, I won't read the details, it provides that it is unlawful for an occupying power to oversee the transfer of citizens from its own country into the occupied territory. And that's exactly what Turkey has done. So it's a major difference between Scotland and Cyprus. There's no doubt about the, the population of Scotland. It's a lawful uh, population. So that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, concludes the first part of my lecture. I'm going to race through the, um, the second and third part. Let me just move on. Uh, I think the, the point I just want to make here is that I'm going to draw a comparison here with Kosovo. Cyprus um, has taken an interest in what's gone on in Kosovo. It's also taken an interest in what's gone on in South Sudan and in other countries where secessions, uh, or purported acts of secession have taken place. But they should take a particular interest in what's going on in this country because of the special relationship that exists between this country and, and the Republic of Cyprus. There's no special relationship between Cyprus and Kosovo, or between Cyprus and South Sudan, or between Cyprus and any other countries around the world which are facing secessionist movements. The United Kingdom has a special relationship with Cyprus through the European Union, through the Treaty of Guarantee, through the Treaty of Establishment, through the sovereign base areas, through the intelligence network at, uh, at uh, Mount Olympus and Ayos uh, Nigolas. British expeditionary uh, operations in Afghanistan hinge upon Cyprus as well as Egypt and the Suez Canal. The relationship uh, is reinforced by the Treaty of Guarantee, which means the United Kingdom is a guarantor power. So we, this, the Republic of Cyprus should not regard the United Kingdom in the same bracket as Kosovo or South Sudan or elsewhere. This is a country of profound importance to the Republic of Cyprus. And as the United Kingdom has taken a profound interest in the Cyprus question, the Republic of Cyprus should take a profound interest in the Scottish question. And I think I've just answered my next question, which is uh, whether the uh, Republic of Cyprus, its citizens and diaspora, should take an active interest in the referendum, uh, of, uh, of, in the referendum of Scotland. They must take an interest. I, I, I hope I've, I've made that absolutely uh, clear. The biggest problem that faces Cyprus is to do with the process. And let me just summarize what I've said earlier before I move to the, the substantive questions and then close and throw it open to discussion. If, let's play this chess game and think several moves ahead. Let us say there's a, the election of a new president in the Republic of Cyprus next year. And let's say he sits at the negotiating table and they cook up a, an agreement along the lines of a bizonal bicommunal federation. What would a clever Turkish Cypriot nationalist do? He'd put his signature to that agreement in the way that the Scottish nationalists accepted devolution in 1998. They'd sit back and wait. They'd 
have a general election. They, their general election campaign would be independence via a referendum. They'd win the election, let's say they won the election. This is the Turkish Cypriot nationalists in, in a legal Turkish Cypriot constituent state. They win the election, and then what do they do? <clears throat> they, they use the mechanisms that have been put in place for the central government to twist the arm of the central government to give them a unilateral right to have a unilateral referendum in the north to break away. They have the referendum, they vote yes, they break away, and they've procured a partition. Uh, I may be com this may be completely p uh, pie in the sky. Maybe pie in the sky. But the risk is there. And we need to know what's going on in the negotiations because we, the citizens of this country and the citizens of Cyprus, should have an input into the negotiations in order to ensure that this doesn't happen. And if there is to be such a constitutional settlement, it should either have entrenched provisions which will prevent any uh, secession in the future, or it should allow for secession to take place, in which case there should be appropriate provisions put in place. We cannot have in the European Union in the 21st century constitutional deals cooked up in, in secret. It's completely anathema. And it's something that you would expect in um, countries outside Europe, but not in Europe. So procedurally, what is taking place in Scotland before our eyes has profound implications uh, for Cyprus. One, other, one last procedural point I want to make about Scotland, and that is to do with the observations of Lord Wallace of Tankerness at Queen's Council. Now, uh, Lord Wallace is, is a Liberal Democrat peer, but he's also the Advocate General for Scotland and as such one of the law officers of the Crown in the United Kingdom government. So together with the Attorney General and the Solicitor General, the Advocate General forms uh, one of the triumvirate of law officers who act as the chief legal advisers of the British government and the Crown generally. And Lord Wallace has done something that the Attorney General in Cyprus, so far as I'm aware, has not done, and that is issue a series of lectures and statements to Parliament which have attempted to clarify the legal position as regards both the legality of the referendum and the legality of the substance underpinning the referendum, which is the Scottish claim uh, for independence. What Lord Wallace has done, now remember who he is, he is the senior legal advisor to the British government on matters of Scottish law. What Lord Wallace has done is he set out what he and his government regard as the correct legal position for a state, A, to have a referendum, and B, to break away in the event of a yes vote. And listen to what he says, and remember these words, because there's all this speculation now by people such as Jack Straw that the Republic of Cyprus is doomed to partition, and in fact, what did Jack Straw say? He said, the United Kingdom government should... It's time for the United Kingdom government to consider formally the partition of Cyprus if the talks fail. And we have this every so often. These people pop up and they say there needs to be a legal partition. Right, listen to what Lord Wallace, QC, has said about um, how a partition can take place or not take place. Nationalists will argue that Scotland should take its place among the nations of the world and contribute to the forums of the world as an independent country in its own right. You can make that point about Turkish Cypriot nationalists. They are making the same sort of arguments uh, in respect of Northern Cyprus. It deserves to have its place in the family of nations. Lord Wallace QC adds, the law is a vital part of this debate. Likewise, the very concept of an independent nation-state is dependent on a body of international law which recognises those states. The great political structures of the world, such as the European Union, the United States, NATO, EFTA, the United Nations and so on, are built on an architecture of law. It is our commitment to the rule of law, to a government of laws, not of men, that's an Aristotelian concept, which defines our place in the world and provides the structure for our relationships with other countries. 
So the law must govern the process. And in Cyprus, and this is when the politicians attack me, the, po the, the law is regarded as an inconvenience in Cyprus. It's to be parked to one side because the politicians want to sit in a chair and cook up the law. But we have reached the stage in the, European, in the history of Europe whereby the law means something. And it's there to protect us, the citizens, at the bottom of the pyramid and to control the people at the top. That's one reason why David Cameron is in trouble, because he wants to ban uh, prisoners from having the vote. Now, we can have an argument over whether or not prisoners should have the vote, but what Mr. Cameron has discovered is that he is subject to the law. And there are certain fundamental principles of law which cannot be set aside. And certain court decisions cannot be set aside. I'm just going to... I'd like to finish within the next 10 or 15 minutes. I'm just going to take you to the Treaty on European Union. This is the treaty governing the European Union and its 27 member states, which now include the Republic of Cyprus, as well as uh, the United Kingdom and Greece, uh, two of the guaranteed powers of the Republic. The European Union member states, including Cyprus, draw inspiration from the cultural, religious, and humanist inheritance of Europe, from which have developed the universal values of the inviolable and inalienable rights of the human person. That means they can't be taken away by politicians. Freedom, democracy, equality, and the rule of law. The member states recall the historic importance of the ending of the division of the European continent and the need to create firm bases for the construction of the future Europe. The Union, this is Article 2, so part of the main binding part of the treaty, the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. So the law acts as a fundamental constraint upon what politicians can do. It acts as an impediment. The politicians have certain freedom of movement, but we've reached a stage in the history of Europe where we've decided that politicians are not going to be given free reign in the way that Hitler and Stalin had free reign to do what they like and abuse citizens and kill them and massacre them and, and torture them. We've put limits on what politicians can do. And this is the point that Lord Wallace is making. So the process must be legal and the outcome of the process must be legal. And I'll just conclude uh, this passage of the lecture with what Lord Wallace said about Europe. And remember, Cyprus is now part of Europe, even though it's geographically also part of the Middle East. The culture of Cyprus, regrettably, is still trapped in the Middle East, like Syria and Gaza, we're seeing it now, aren't we, where just brutality reigns and govern top-down governance reigns. But politically and legally and spiritually part of Europe, in spite of the Eurozone disaster that we're seeing. So the Lord Wallace QC adds, the European project is a legal construct. The European Union constitutes a new legal order and when we consider Scotland's place within that order, we have to consider it as a matter of international and EU law. It will simply not do to say that we can put the law aside in considering the future of the European Union. The institutions of the European Union arose from the ashes of a continent which had been shattered by the actions of governments who held the rule of law in contempt, who regarded rights and justice as affectations. So it is not surprising that law is at the core of the European project. And he adds, as we approach the referendum in Scotland, let us not be afraid to engage in a mature and reasonable debate about the many legal issues that are thrown up by the independence debate. That's what we need in Cyprus, a mature and rational debate conducted in public with the law officers concerned laying their cards on the table rather than keeping their cards to themselves or putting them up their sleeve so that only they and their friends can see them. I think I've made my point on, on that. Let me now, uh, and it's approaching nine o'clock, turn to the substance of the uh, lecture. I've done that. Should the Republic of Cyprus and its citizens openly object to Scottish independence? And if so, should the Republic of Cyprus also object 
to an independent Scotland remaining or becoming a member of the European Union. I chose my words carefully there for reasons which will become apparent in a moment. Now, I would submit that the citizens of Cyprus will be caught between two conflicting emotions if they care to take an interest in the, Cyprus, in the Scottish question. On the one hand, they would probably be most impressed and influenced by the rhetoric of Alex Salmond, whose central argument is that Scotland must be freed from British rule. He adds, this is Alex Salmond, Scotland needs independence, self-determination and self-respect. That's something he said in 2005. So Alex Salmond has been deploying the rhetoric that was deployed by the Greek Cypriots during the days of Enosis, in, or the campaign for Enosis in the 1950s self-determination, freedom from British rule, independence for Scots, because the Cypriots wanted Enosis, which was union with Greece, but they wanted independence from the British. That's what Alex Salmond is campaigning for. So the heart is being pulled that way by Alex Salmond. On the other hand, Mr Cameron, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, is deploying the sort of rhetoric that the Republic of Cyprus has been deploying since 1974. Mr. Cameron said in Edinburgh on the 16th of February, I believe in a United Kingdom. I believe that England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are stronger together than they would ever be apart. Well, that's rather like a politician in Cyprus saying, I believe that, get, that districts of Gerinia, Famagusta, Nicosia, Larnaca, Limassol and Bafos would be stronger if they were united under one state rather than fragmented into two. So the citizens of Cyprus are caught between these two conflicting emotions. I'm going to now leave the emotive slogans to one side and pinpoint um, four reasons. I'm only going to pinpoint them and then we can have a discussion. Four reasons why the Republic should object to Scottish independence. Firstly, um, I've already made this point, if the Republic of Cyprus, if the United Kingdom is partitioned and if Scotland becomes an independent state using this process, this will establish a very dangerous precedent for Cyprus. I've mentioned Kosovo and South Sudan and other uh, acts of secession, but this will be the first time that a, an existing member of the European Union has par been partitioned since joining the European Union. Czechoslovakia was split into two before accession. The Republic of Cyprus joined the European Union as a de facto partition state. This will be the first occasion on which we will see a de jure, a lawful partition, take place within the context of the European Union. So that's a very dangerous precedent that I would suggest the Republic would want to avoid. Secondly, Mr Salmond, the First Minister of Scotland, has claimed that if the United Kingdom is partitioned, there won't just be a territorial partition between... Uh, south and north of the international frontier, there will also be an offshore partition of the offshore resources. And Alex Salmond has even gone as far as to claim that Scotland is entitled to 90% of the oil and gas reserves off the coast of the United Kingdom. Does the Republic of Cyprus want to see a precedent established within the European Union whereby the northern part of a country that breaks away takes 90% of the oil and gas with it. Think about it. Thirdly, it's been mooted by some commentators and uh, academics that if Scotland achieves independence, the United Kingdom may wish to retain sovereign base areas in Scotland. As remember, the British nuclear uh, deterrent is now in the hands of the Royal Navy and the Royal Navy has uh, nuclear bases in Scotland. It's only been suggested, it's only been floated as an idea, but it's possible that if there's a yes vote, the United Kingdom may reach a compromise with Scotland whereby the British will retain sovereign base areas in Scotland. Does the Republic of Cyprus want to see a fresh instance of a fresh instance of sovereign base areas emerging. Because they're unique, the ones in Cyprus. They're potentially open to legal challenge. That's again a subject for another day. My point is, does the Republic of Cyprus wish to see the establishment of a, of a new precedent 
in the European Union whereby a sovereign state, such as Scotland, has allowed another sovereign state, the United Kingdom, to establish and maintain sovereign base areas within its territory. Think about it. Fourthly, the United Kingdom is a guarantor power of the Republic of Cyprus. We know that in 1974 the United Kingdom did not exercise uh, the, the power that it had to deploy forces and resist the Turkish aggression and protect the sovereignty and independence of the Republic of Cyprus. However, the Republic of Cyprus is still entitled to the British guarantee and the protection given by the treaty as a matter of law. And now the Republic of Cyprus may well have to call upon the United Kingdom's forces to protect the oil and the, the natural gas infrastructure that's off the coast of Cyprus. Cyprus is now friendly with Israel. Israel, as we're seeing in Gaza, has many enemies, and those enemies carry lots of weapons. And they do nasty things, as the Israelis do. It's conceivable that there will be a, 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 an attack launched against Cyprus, and the Republic would have to call upon the United Kingdom to spring to its defence. If Scotland breaks away, the Scottish element of the United Kingdom's armed forces would go with it. And we know from history that the British armed forces rely con considerably upon Scottish soldiers and Scottish service personnel. So does the Republic of Cyprus wish to see the Treaty of Guarantee, uh, the British guarantee under the Treaty of Guarantee, weakened by the flaking away of Scotland from the United Kingdom? And remember, if the United Kingdom is diminished without Scotland, the calls upon United Kingdom to leave the Security Council will grow. But that's, an, again, another story for another day. I would just urge the Republic of Cyprus to give these matters serious consideration. Let me make one final point, and it's to do with uh, the, uh, the European Union aspect. Um, it's five past nine, and time's running out. Um, but let me just make one final point, and then I'll conclude. If Scotland manages to achieve independence, a legal argument will arise. If Scotland leaves the United Kingdom, will it automatically leave the European Union as well? That's what the United Kingdom is arguing. Alternatively, will Scotland leave the United Kingdom but at the same time stay within the European Union? Have you understood that, 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 that distinction? Look, the Scots are suggesting, the Alex Salmond rather, not the Scots, the Scottish nationalists under Alex Salmond are suggesting that because Scotland's already part of the European Union, if it achieves independence, it will automatically stay within the European Union. Lord Wallace QC and the British government have taken a different view. They've suggested that Scotland will be, have to leave the European Union and then um, have to reapply to join. What should the Republic of Cyprus do, therefore? Should it issue a proclamation? I'm going to wrap up by offering two or three uh, thoughts here. I would suggest, I'm going to just float this as an idea, and you can, you can attack me afterwards verbally, uh, <laughs> although the flag is being cooked and the skewer could be used for good effect for other reasons as well. I'm going to suggest the Republic of Cyprus should give serious consideration to issuing a proclamation by the President of the Republic to the effect that they object to the referendum process for the reasons I've articulated and they object to the principle of Scottish independence via secession or otherwise. Now remember, there are courtesies in international relations and one state doesn't normally meddle in the domestic politics of another. But, hey, what did Tony Blair do before the Annan Plan? He told the voters in Cyprus to vote yes. So the Republic of Cyprus can turn around to the British and say, well, you meddled in our domestic referendum. It's our turn now to meddle in your referendum. What else did the British do before the referendum in Cyprus? They sent Lord Hannay, remember him? To be the special envoy to Cyprus. Well, the Republic of Cyprus, in my view, should send a special envoy to the United Kingdom to monitor what is going on, to report back, to issue statements, to uh, participate in the consultation exercise and, as Lord Hannay did, meddle in the domestic politics of this country. 
because the national interests of the Republic of Cyprus are at stake for a multiplicity of reasons. And Cyprus should hopefully by now have reached the stage of maturity to go down this path and not be afraid of upsetting the British or anybody else. They should, well, they'll certainly upset um, Alex Salmond. But I would suggest they will be doing the United Kingdom government a favour and doing themselves a favour. So I just offer you those two suggestions. The President of Cyprus should issue a proclamation and the, um, um, the Republic of Cyprus pr uh, President should send a special envoy to the United Kingdom. Although who's going to pay for it is another matter. I would make one other suggestion by way of conclusion, and that is we can't rely on the government of Cyprus to do its job. We can't rely on, on them having the, the political nous or the political courage to go down the path I've suggested. So it's ultimately down to us, as citizens in this country, to actively become involved in the referendum campaign. I'm going to join the No campaign. I hope as many of you join the No campaign. We have experience, I have experience of, of achieving a No in a referendum. I, I, I didn't vote in Cyprus, but I campaigned for No in the referendum in 2004. All of us should participate in the campaign. I'm going to be with No. You're welcome to be in the Yes camp, but we as citizens of this country should actively participate in the referendum campaign. And we should encourage our fellow citizens with Cypriot roots in Scotland to participate actively in the referendum as well, because it could be that a Giriagidis or a Garaulis, who happens to be living up there and has a vote, could swing the vote in favour of no. So we need to energise ourselves down here and our, our, our fellow citizens in Scotland to, to participate in the campaign. Right, that's enough uh, from me. I'm going to close with a, a timeless observation. Let me just... Uh, I'm going to close with a timeless observation from the philosopher I mentioned at the outset of the lecture, David Hume. Because what this philosopher said helps us to understand what has happened in Cyprus and what is happening in the United Kingdom. According to David Hume, nothing is more surprising than the easiness with which the many are governed by the few. Think about that. I close on that note.